Bitcoin still trading around 30K even amidst all this massive FUD and global markets seeming to be melting down. It seems like we're finally getting past the Luna disaster, the self-inflicted wound that was the collapse of UST and Luna. I've got Tom Dunleavy here today with me, one of the most popular guests of late. You guys loved him last time he was on, and so we decided I'd like to keep uh, bringing him back. He was actually, you know, looking at research and numbers and, you know, facts not opinions. We like to try to present facts here uh, and actual analysis and not just tell you the things that we think are going to happen. So he's going to uh, give us some context as to where we're at with markets in general and, of course, the crypto market. We're going to review all the news, look at a few charts. We're just going to do the thing, guys. Let's go. Let's go. What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, also known as the Wolf of All Streets. Before we get started, please subscribe to the channel and take the Snoop Dogg action figure that you obviously have laying around and drop him on your like button. You got to like the button today. Let uh, Snoop do a little crip walk on the like button. You know, that little dance that Snoop does that everybody loves called the crip walk. Learn something every day. Before we get started, guys, of course, as I always tell you, Vault. Write down our amazing sponsor on Mondays and Tuesdays. They allow you to invest without stress. Imagine investing without stress, right? They have the uh, highest yields uh, in the CFI space, about 12.68% on USDC, 6.7% on Bitcoin and Ethereum. And that has not glitched even here in this market downturn. Forgetting all that, my favorite feature that they have allows you to automatically buy the dip so that you can get your emotions and stupidity out of the way. I'm going to buy the dip. I'm going to buy the dip. We all know how it goes. And then the dip comes and you're going to buy the next dip, right? Nobody ever buys the dip uh, manually when they have the opportunity and they can do that for you automatically. So guys, hope you're all doing well today. What do we got here? Greetings from London, fellow Milkarians. Cool. Cool. Is Scott saying bald? No, only in the front, but in the back, I'm voluptuous hair. That's, you can't say voluptuous about hair, but I'm going to say it anyways. Yeah, you can uh, let Snoop drop it like it's hot right on that like button. So listen, guys, kind of a pivotal moment here, I think, for the, the crypto space in general, in my opinion, right? We've reached another one of these likely potential bottoms. And, you know, I think that there's really mixed feelings on which way it's likely to go from here. I've made no real... Uh, I've been pretty clear that I think that a likely bottom is in. Uh, as I was talking to Tom about right before we got started, and I think he'll agree, I'll bring him on in a second, bottoming to me is a process, right? You don't, you don't need to find the exact point on the exact bottom of that one long wick that's the bottom, right? You can look back at last year's summer, we dropped basically from 53,000 to 42,000 thousand or no that was december excuse me sixty thousand all the way down to the low 30s in a matter of 10 days a little bit later right in june we got down to around 28 and then it took three or four months to form that bottom never really revisiting that complete low before we had opto october and everybody uh got super excited and that was basically the only good month we've had in a year let's be honest right and so i'm gonna go ahead and bring on tom from masari right here man tom how are you today Morning, sir. Pretty good. I think last time we were on, you had COVID. I I am have a mild case right now, so we're gonna have to work on timing in the future. But uh, yeah, happy oh, to be here. Happy to chat with I'm you. I'm never inviting you back because that means that <laughs> I'm gonna have COVID. Who next. else is left to get it, right? The, our producer. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I I should be the bionic man at this point, at least for another month or two. I'm glad that uh, it's mild. If you if you do have it, that's always good news. Mine was moderate to less than miles <laughs> to be like 103 104 on a fever or something when yeah when i was, I was definitely uh definitely crushing it on the uh, temperature front so listen i know that you have uh quite a bit of data for us i've obviously been talking about the fact that markets could be bottoming right and i've been saying it basically for a week i said that we sort of in my opinion at least anecdotally we reached that fever pitch of it's all going to zero. It can't go up. Nobody sees a bullish case. It's all over. It has to go down lower. A lot of that. And it, it, in fact, not that I use it as gospel by any stretch, but the crypto fear and greed index right now is eight, right? The, that's the lowest it's been since March 2020. And when we were at 25,000 last week, it was 13. So people are actually becoming more fearful, seemingly, even as we've already had 
this initial bounce. I don't know if you want to share your screen. I know you have a whole bunch of charts and probably didn't share the screen. If you don't know how, you hit that little share button down below and then pull it up. Um, and I know that you had some charts that sort of, I mean, at least support slightly that idea, right? So here. There we go. Here you go. Have at it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Try to keep it a little, uh, little shorter than last time. But generally, I think the theme is folks are underweight. So crypto still follows macro for better or for worse. And this big sell-off started off mostly macro. We got the enormous Luna sell-off from whatever, 85,000 Bitcoins they sold into the market. But right now, crypto follows macro. So the broader macro picture, this is a survey of all managers to see where they are in their equity allocations. You can see here's where we are right now. We're as low almost as we were back at the COVID lows. And before that, it was only March 2008 where we were even lower. So folks are underweight stocks. Here's another survey, overweight cash, big, big numbers. Uh, and that's not just, this is sort of fund managers. And this is actually like your corporate balance sheets. This is Google, Amazon, whoever, they all are sitting on this enormous pile of cash. So <clears throat> what does that mean to, to what you were saying earlier? You know, folks are ready to hop back in here. They're just looking for the right level. They're looking to say, hey, are we close to a bottom? And they're not going to time it perfectly. They're probably going to try to leg back in. So they're looking for signs to get that done. Um, so the thing that I'm looking at are where are valuations, where are earnings, right? So price to earnings ratio, I think everyone's sort of familiar with. Over here, here's where we're at right now. We're at like a 16 or so. You could see based on history, that's kind of in line. If we do get worse, if we do have a bigger downturn, this is, uh, you know, 2018, we had a sell off in late in the year and this is 2020. We had a big sell off obviously with COVID. If we get back to those lows, that's probably like 35, 3,600 on the S and P, which will likely take us lower as well in Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, maybe another 10, 15%. But to your earlier point is that, you know, you're not going to catch the bottom perfectly, but you're going to hopefully leg on the way down. And I think we're nearing that bottom. We're getting to the bottom where the valuations in the equity market make sense for folks to kind of hop back in here and they have that cash to do it. Yeah, I mean, listen, Warren Buffett's been sitting on a pile of increasing cash forever, and he's finally deploying, right? Not saying that it's gospel when a 400-year-old person decides to make a financial decision, but the guy's got a pretty good track record of buying the right things at the right time. And also, when you have these piles of cash on the sideline, we all know what really happens. They're waiting for this bottom to buy, but then you actually start to get price melting up and they buy higher. Right. I mean, just like retail, just like anyone else, they they're not all, all these people sitting on these massive, uh, you know, mounds of cash are not going to jump in at the perfect low moment. They're going to buy yeah. higher. A lot of them. And it's it's an interesting thing right now that Bitcoin and Ethereum have sat above 30,000 for so long. Mentally, I think a lot of people see now this you know 29,000 number on Bitcoin this 2000 number on Ethereum as a as a buy button because their mental model is sort of sit set much higher. Uh, I think what finally gets the next flow of capital in though is some sort of actual uh, appreciation in price, whatever brings us there. I think it's the merge. I'm sure other people think, you know, whatever the next happening is, we'll do it. But I think once that next catalyst happen is when institutions and others finally jump in because in a perverse way, the big money, it's easier for them to buy in at higher prices because they have less career risk. They're saying, oh yeah, Bitcoin right. and Ethereum have finally established themselves. We can buy now. Um, so there's- Yeah, people are afraid. I Yeah, if you're like a risk manager, you're allocating for a big fund, you don't want to be the guy catching the falling knife as it continues down, which a lot of people uh, did very publicly with Luna last week, unfortunately. Um, you know, and, and obviously those things can kind of blow up. So I agree with you. I think, you know, we traders, you look at a chart and you say, well, I want confirmation. Maybe a resistance is flipped to a support, but that just works mentally and fundamentally for anyone who's really allocating. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I think we could talk about Bitcoin buyers and others jumping back in, but you've seen, and I've seen a few charts on Twitter that I pop here. I think this is crypto quant. These are the order books and, and folks are actually buying the dip. You can see kind of the bid walls down here. This is the big sell-off from the LFG. Uh, this is on Coinbase. And then you can see right here, this is USDC flowing in to buy the dip on BTC. So 
I, I think we could talk about it a lot, but you can actually see it in the order books, which is exciting. Uh, hopefully the flows are supporting it as well. Like you said, they sold over 80,000 Bitcoin and we're still sitting here at 30. I mean, to, to me, that, that when you have that event where you have this known seller that dumps that much on the market and there were still people, and listen, volume shows it as well. We've had these massive, massive, biggest volume candles we've had in years, you know, sort of buying up these dips. I show you an article right now that's sort of, if we want to actually use like data and not uh, just go anecdotally, crypto funds saw year's highest inflows as terror crisis crashed markets, right? So you're seeing it in volume. You're seeing it obviously with USDC entering exchanges to buy the dip and digital asset funds are getting massive inflows, which means that high net worth accredited investors are sending their money into these people to buy the dip for them. Totally. And if you think about, so I think it was 34 billion last year in hedge fund, uh, or 66 billion in hedge fund, 34 VC or vice versa, whatever. That's a hundred billion dollars at the end of last year that was raised. That wasn't all deployed last year. That's still sitting around ready to, to leg in, I think at least in some capacity. And there was a ton raised in Q1. So there's, there's a ton of money on the sidelines ready to, to buy the dip. And these, these cycles happen so much faster than they used to. We had a, a two month recession because of COVID that's, that would have been 18, 24 months back in the day. So these things happen quick. And I think the cycle for crypto is going to be just as quick. I mean, some could argue that it should have been 18 to 24 months, but we artificially ended that recession, which is probably a contributing factor to what's happening right now. But yes, you know, we know that the Fed is going to step in and soften any blow that they can if they see an incoming recession. And that, that's why I think that they're also not going to continue uh, aggressively raising rates at the pace that they've set. Because if they see yeah. this going into a recession and they see us really having a major dump in the stock market any further, they're not going to keep raising rates into that. Maybe I'm wrong. So the Fed wants to tighten financial conditions and financial conditions, the equity markets are a part of that because the wealth effect is the theory is if folks have more money in their bank accounts, if they have more money in crypto and housing, that's going to naturally get them to spend more in prices. So they want to bring the stock market down to a certain extent and where that level is, is unknown. There are some analysts on Wall Street who are saying that we could even go below the level that I said, 3,500, because the Fed wants to take out a ton of excess uh, inflation from the market. I disagree with that because I think inflation will still naturally come down on its own, kind of what we talked about on the first time I was on here. So I, I think we're nearing some sort of uh, Fed sort of capitulation as they start to see inflation rolling off. They're I think inflation topped. Uh, yeah. like, okay, I won't say that actual inflation is topped. I'll say that the inflation numbers yeah, have yeah. likely topped. <laughs> However, they may cook those numbers or determine them at any varying point in time is uh, up to anyone to, to decide whether they believe it or not. But yeah, I, I think that that's probably the, the case as well. And, and I mentioned obviously, uh, you know, Tara before, let me see uh, if I can get this. Yeah. Uh, Terra community seems dead set against Do Kwan's fork proposal, right? So obviously Do Kwan is trying to uh, rise like a phoenix from the ashes. And I think people just want to see it burn at this point. Um, sadly, or for better or for worse. Honestly, not sadly, because I I'm sad for the people that it's affected. And obviously I would love to see Luna holders made whole. But when you ask for a free market and you have a truly free market, this is what should happen to companies that do wrong. They should fail, right? The problem is that there's a lot of investors, but like if you had gone back to 2008 and maybe let some of those banks and companies that are now zombies fail, it would have been horrible, but maybe we'd be in a better place today, right? So if you, you can't really say, I want a free market, but then also be like, let's bail them out. Let's, yeah. And let's put that in perspective. Luna and Terra combined or UST and Luna combined were something like $50 billion dollars. As a percentage of the crypto market cap, I think that was something like four or five percent. That's like Microsoft failing. If Microsoft failed in the stock market, you could better believe shit would hit the fan way worse than it did in crypto. So this, in a perverse way, I think it's an interesting case of how crypto can self-regulate and have these blow ups and still be OK. Yeah, half the, half the hash rate went offline at one time in China last year and the Bitcoin network just kept chugging along, right? No bailouts, no uh, fiscal policy change, no quantitative easing. It just keeps on going. That's, that's what happens in an actual free market. I, I make the argument very often that Bitcoin is the last free market on earth. As a result of that, like you said, 
Nobody's stepping in to do anything here. It's just happening. And here we are at 30,000. Nick Carter just tweeted a chart about Bitcoin mining while you bring it up. It looks like it's it's petering back into China now, which is uh, which is interesting. It's like 25 percent of the, the hash rates now back, back in China. And, and I saw an article and I, you know, I, I hate to be the guy who does the I read the headline and made a judgment thing. I did not read the article, but I did see headlines that uh, there was quite a bit of mining that actually never went offline in China. I don't know if that's true or, or what happened, but it seems that maybe uh, it was even a slightly bit overblown. But 25% seems like a pretty high number right now. It's pretty astounding. Uh, it's and, and it's a busy morning, too. Well, if, if we want to sw- flip back to Terra, uh, it looks like Do Kwan's actually getting called now in front of uh, South Korea's ruling party to explain this, this collapse. So I wonder how that affects his plans of trying to fork this new chain. And also, he's going to have to answer for, uh, was it Basis Cash or the other algorithmic stable coin he tried? I forget if it was Basis Cash or not. Yeah. Um, it seems like this he doesn't is, have the best like- track record, unfortunately. And it's interesting because everybody loved him when he was you know, going to buy up to $10 billion of Bitcoin uh, to back uh, Luna. But they don't really love you so much when you turn around and hit the sell button with the same coins. Yeah, agreed. And I think the issue with this broader proposal that folks are talking about the one that um do Kwan proposed here is it's trying to bail out so what is it it's you know we're going to fork luna and the old chain is going to be called terra classic the new chain is going to be called luna which is confusing enough uh they're going to airdrop luna or the new luna to the old lunar holders and the security of the new chain they're going to pay for in inflation and they're going to have a set inflation target of seven percent per year and then they're going to, the airdrop schedule is going to be to the old UST holders and the old Luna holders. The, the issue people have is that they're giving it to the Luna holders in this airdrop more than they are the UST holders. So the UST holders were the people who are trying to save, trying to earn that 20%. The Luna holders were the more speculative ones. And it seems in this latest proposal that they're really rewarding the speculative investors rather than the savers. A page out of uh, the United States government book. Right. I mean, it's socialism for the wealthy and the big funds who are heavily invested and good old capitalism for the USD holders, which was every man that was trying to save. That's that. That's not what we want here. Right. That that I think that counters the ethos of crypto altogether. Right. It's like it's an easy target too for regulators. Yeah, I, well, I, we have shot ourselves in the foot repeatedly here with this one. What, do you, what are your thoughts now, actually, on what will happen with regulation? Because that seems to be the hot button topic. It's not like we weren't already in the crosshairs. We know that we were. But uh, this is a pretty major self-inflicted wound on the largest stage. You got Janet Yellen literally on TV talking about Luna, right? I never thought that was not on my bingo card for 2022. It's it's sad. Uh, yeah, I th- I think in general, they were given, all the different government agencies were given 180 days from sometime in mid-March to provide feedback um, to the Biden administration of what their plans were to regulate the space. And that was all in the spirit of innovation. And it was rosy, I think, at the time. Part of that was going to be looking at stable coins in general. So you can bet this will be a case study within that. Where we go from here, I don't know. I think there's probably going to be some level of collateralization recommended, but I don't know how they enforce that, and um, it, it'll be interesting to see. I, I do think this moves moves us towards uh, the U.S. Uh, sort of stable coin at some point to the Fed coin, whatever you want to call it, which I am frightened for, uh, which is un- unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, I think the days of algorithm- algorithmic stable coins in the United States are likely done. Right. Yeah, agreed. And. It, it, it brings in, you know, some great algorithm. There, there's some great models out there like Frax, I think is, is interesting, which is a fractional reserve. You know, you don't have to have, you know, it's slightly under collateralized, but having collateral of zero doesn't seem like a good idea anymore or whatever is 5%. <laughs> or collateral of something that can cut in half in, you know, five minutes. I thought I was going crazy at the time. I was like, Bitcoin and Luna are really correlated. Why would we put this in the reserve? And I guess- And AVAX, was- right? And they also yeah. had Avalanche, so- uh, yeah, right, you talk about fractional reserve banking, right? You try to talk about having a fractional reserve. You mentioned USDT apparently has had seven billion in redemptions in the last forty-eight hours, according to Palo Arduino, without even sweating. Do you know of any other institution that could uh, instantaneously redeem seven billion dollars to holders? That's unbelievable. 
I, the thing that um, everyone's tried to tear, tear, or tear uh, tether down forever, and it seems so resilient. I, I don't know what else could take it down at this point, especially with these broad market downturns that don't seem to depeg it. What actually concerns me more than anything is half a tether is sitting on Tron. And this might be my ignorance, but I'm not sure what is going on over there and why so much tether sits on Tron. The re I mean, as far as I understand it, and this is far from a deep understanding, but it's just really cheap to send Tether on Tron. So it's become the most popular chain for your average person to move Tether around because it costs pennies instead of, and if you look back at peak bull market, I mean, it could cost you, you know, $50 to send $40 uh, in, in Tether from one person to another on Ethereum. It just didn't work. But yeah, why that is still the case, I don't know, because obviously uh, gas fees have dropped tremendously. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, but I so I think it's in general right now, it's hard to be super bullish, but I think there are things to look forward to. Um, if we do reach a bottom in the next few months or a month or two, I think it's a great time to accumulate. Everyone wanted March 2020 prices or, you know, 2018 prices and here, here they are. So if you want to buy, this is, you know, this is the time. You buy to Netflix at a 50% discount to the COVID lows. Right. I mean, this isn't like unique to, to Bitcoin. I mean, ARC, yeah, you go back a couple of years and buy, uh, you know, so how much wood could a Kathy Wood chuck or whatever. I mean, you can get anything Kathy Wood likes at, at those discounts, right? This isn't okay. unique to crypto. But I love what you just said. You said there's almost no reason something's effective. There's almost no reason to feel bullish right now. People aren't feeling that way. That's when general wealth, generational wealth is made, when nobody's feeling bullish and there's seemingly no reason to feel that way, if you have patience. Exactly. I walked upstairs with a big smile on my face the other day. My wife's like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, we get to buy at discount prices if you believe in the long-term asset. This is enormous. But just to go back to Kathy Wood, and um, if we if you want to talk equities since it's relevant to crypto, Coinbase, sure. this, whole, this whole FUD around Coinbase bankruptcy is absolutely insane in my mind. If you it literally at, said the word bankruptcy and people are like, they're going bankrupt. You're like, no, it's actually just a required disclosure. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm not going to pull up the financial statements, but I'll just, I'll tell you a few simple stats that jumped out at me. They have 6 billion in cash. Their long-term debt is only $3 billion. So they could literally pay off everything if they wanted to today. It's they're, not $3 billion. Yeah. Their expense on that debt is 22 million. And this is a company that made uh, 1 .1 1.1 billion last year. <laughs> and you know, it's trading at a PE of like five, which is a sixth of, you know, what a growth stock should be. And it's only a 16 billion market cap, which you have private company companies in crypto. I think like OpenSea is worth that much right now in their latest round. So it's, I've been buying Coinbase, but I never stopped buying Coinbase, unfortunately. So yes, yeah, so it's, it's really great to say that I might've called the bottom, but uh, when you've been buying since roughly $300, it's not really that impressive. <laughs> Same. I, I think it's just an easy way for retail and others to short the crypto sort of trend that down. They're just, hey, let's yeah, just short this thing. It, it's it, why, why, why borrow money to short uh, short Bitcoin when you can just short Coinbase, right? And uh, but I think that 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 also means it'll probably bounce harder, right? If it's trading like this sort of high beta, you know, uh, leveraged play on Bitcoin, that that also works on the way up. Maybe miners are really cheap now too, in the same regard. Agreed. And they're definitely making money at this sort of profit level uh, in terms of actually buying and selling Bitcoin miners. That's another good one to look at for sure. Awesome, man. Well, I'm going to go let you uh, recover from your very mild case of, of COVID. Now I got to keep on going here, but man, I appreciate your insight. You're all obviously welcome back. Uh, Any time to join us. Uh, what's your, your Twitter for people who want to follow is Dunleavy89, right? At Dunleavy89. Yes, sir. Appreciate you having me on and uh Enjoy the rest of the show. Check them out, guys. Thanks, Tom. Feel better. Oh, I hit the wrong button. That's what I do. Uh, yeah, hit the wrong button there and almost uh, stopped the whole stream instead of just uh, getting Tom off because my cursor was in the wrong place. But yeah, let's keep going, guys, with a bit of the news. Let's see what we got here. Uh, City... City. It's weird still to me, like I have to pinch myself when you see that these statements coming from the biggest banks in the world about crypto on a daily basis, like two or three years ago, you would have never even had any of them talking about us. It's pretty crazy. But City says fallout from Terra collapse, unlikely to hit wider financial system. Yeah, no shit. Right. Uh, it's a big story for us because we're down this rabbit hole. It's a great story for the media to latch on to. But USD and Luna are not nearly big enough to cause contagion. 
throughout the entire financial system. That would be nonsense. But interestingly, as I said, recent weakness in Bitcoin equities looks contemporaneous. and doesn't show any lag or lead effect, the bank analysis said. So they're saying there's actually a little bit of a dubious correlation there. Maybe they're just sort of crashing at the same time for different reasons. Uh, and that Bitcoin has not been leading, which is interesting because we've definitely seen very often, at least anecdotally, Bitcoin or crypto dumping into the weekend before stocks drop next. But that's big. Uh, the big take from City here. Obviously, we have big money investors who boosted Bitcoin's price might now crash it. This is the old, uh, good old story of we cheered for institutional adoption when the number went up, but we know that they have weak hands or the most likely to sell in very large quantities when the price is going down, right? Remember when it used to be short the bankers long Bitcoin and that became, oh, but banks like us now, so we should cheer for them because number go up. Well, that doesn't work so well. Look at this picture. I literally can't even fathom why this is the picture on Coindesk for this article. Oh, because Bitcoin and stocks have become bedfellows, for better or for worse. And apparently those are bedfellows. Apparently those are actual people. But, uh, and, and not Cabbage Patch dolls. But that's cool. Uh, I have no idea what that picture really is talking about. But yes, I think we all know now that uh, to some degree, a lot of these institutions that had a very uh, weak sort of position on Bitcoin, I'm not talking about financially, but I'm talking about their general position on the asset and its importance, are going to puke it first when they need liquidity. And that's clearly what has been happening here. We already talked about crypto funds. Let's dig in really quickly to some charts. Nothing's changed here on the weekly, right? I mean, if you ever wanted a case for a likely bottom, this candle certainly gives it to you, right? Of course, you need confirmation and further. And we know that technical analysis is a bit of a meme, especially in the face of a global market meltdown. But we use the tools that we have. You got the 200 EMA, that red line right there. It's only been tested three times since it has existed on Coinbase because, of course, you have to be in existence for 200 weeks to get the 200 candles to even have a 200 EMA, which happened in October of 2018. But here you go. Tested there, closed above. Two candles tested it here. Two candles wicked below it. That's in March of 2020. Both still, even in that crash, closed on the 200 EMA. And now we have a wick down to it uh, and a breach with a nice massive bounce on huge volume back above it. And most importantly, we have this sort of liquidity grab below the June lows uh, from 2021, right there around 28,800 on Coinbase. I think it's 28,600 on Bitstamp. Going on to the daily, you can see that that's that same level. Like I said, 28,600 here on the Bitstamp chart. But we haven't even closed a daily candle below that, much, much, much less a weekly, right? And we've retested it as support. So to me, as long as we're trading sort of above that level, I think we have the potential for, you know, inverse head and shoulders, V-shape reversal, whatever you want to call it, V-shape recovery. Uh, but like this should not be... Uh, this should not be minimized how large this wick is, right? I mean, that went down to 25,400 and still closed back above 28,600 in one day. And you go back to the weekly, it's been a long time since we've seen a candle like this in this context, right? One, two, three, that was the seventh red candle. Never happened in history, right? We're working on the eighth right now. We've never had seven red candles in a row, never had six red candles in a row. So, yeah, we've had candles with long wicks down before, but not in the context of being at the true bottom of a massive drop, right? Here, it's sort of, you see the candle right here. It's chopping sideways when that's happening, right? It's a good signal that buyers are interested, but it's not the same as it being on the seventh down week. I really think that technically looking at the chart, we should see further upside coming. Helicopter Ben, excuse me, Ben Bernanke says he doesn't see value in Bitcoin. He's known as Helicopter Ben because he always, uh, when he was the chairman of the Fed, I believe, he basically said, yeah, just, uh, you know, give people a whole bunch of free money and we'll be good. We'll be good. That was really his. They even used a helicopter here with money flying out of it uh, to represent this article about Bernanke. But no surprise that when we're here kind of near the bottom and things are suffering, they're piling on the FUD as usual. So they call in the big guns, right? This is when you get like Munger and Buffett on the phone and be like, can we get a soundbite about crypto and Bitcoin? We need you guys to call it rat poison squared or something like that. Well, here you go. Helicopter bed suggested in 2002 that the Fed could simply drop money from helicopters to ward off deflationary conditions. That goes really well, right? And this is what he had to say about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general. Gold has underlying use value, he argued. You can use it to fill cavities. 
first of all, who the fuck is using gold to fill cavities in 2022? Literally, our parents have gold in their mouths from filling cavities. The underlying use value of a Bitcoin is to do ransomware or something like that. What a jackass, right? Completely dismissive of Bitcoin as an asset class, says it has no fundamental value except for ransomware. Going back to the most disproven and stupid FUD that we likely have, which is Bitcoin is only for criminals, right? We've heard it a million times. It's still a talking point, unbelievably still a talking point because it obviously shouldn't be. We know that less than 1% uh, of transactions on the Bitcoin network are used for any sort of ransomware, criminal activity, et cetera. But you still have a guy like this putting out quotes saying that Bitcoin is primarily used for ransomware and criminals. Uh, and what else did he say about the economy now? Under a benign scenario, Bernanke said he expects the economy to slow and unemployment to rise even as inflation remains high. You could call it stagflation. Yes, you could, because that's literally the actual name for it. Thank you, Ben, for ringing in. I'm not sure why they asked you, but your opinion is unwelcome because it's dumb and not based on facts. S&P Global Ratings forms DeFi Group to build out crypto framework. I, I wish Tom was still here because SMP is trying to compete, man. Trying to take, take uh, Masari's job here, right? By providing research on DeFi and other markets. I love this guy's name. The first time I read this, I had to read it twice. The credit rating giant named Charles Chuck Mounts as DeFi officer to lead the unit. I was like, why, why is this guy mounting the chief DeFi officer? But it's actually his last name. He's not mounting him. He is him. His name is Charles Chuck Mounts. And to give you the uh, greatest hits here, Chuck Mounts, what a good name. Like this guy either should be a major league baseball player or a definitely like a B-rate porn star. But Chuck Mounts will lead the group as chief DeFi officer and will work closely with the newly appointed head of DeFi transformation, Charles Jansen, according to a statement Monday. The team seeks to build out S&P's analytics and risk assessment capabilities for both traditional finance and DeFi clients. An S&P move comes after fellow major credit rating player Moody's said last year, was looking to hire crypto analysts to come to grips with the potential wide-reaching impact of decentralized finance on existing ecosystems. Yes, we guys, we know. Biggest companies in the world are going to have to continue to do a deep dive into crypto alongside the rest of us and understand it because if they don't understand it, they will obviously be left behind and they're going to put systems in place to be a part of this movement. Sadly, I don't know if you guys saw this, but TVL and DeFi right now is down like 60% or something. A lot of that because of USD and Luna. But I believe there's only about 70 billion total locked in DeFi at the moment. Really astoundingly low numbers considering how far we went. Finally, Elon Musk, Twitter deal cannot move forward until CEO shows extent of bot activity. Oh, the irony, right? Oh, the irony that uh, he's going to put in this deal and then he's going to rail against the bots and that the bots could end up canceling the deal. Hate the bots. But he said, you know, cannot move forward until he has determined precisely how many users on Twitter are fake. There's been conjecture that maybe this is all just a grand scheme for Elon Musk to troll everybody, never really do this deal. You know, obviously he's talking about doing it at $54 per share valuation. I haven't even looked, but let's take a look at where Twitter's at now. It's probably 40-ish, right? 37.40. Yeah, not ideal. So you think Elon Musk wants to get a, find a way out of a deal where he said he would buy it for $54 per share? Yeah, potentially. Potentially a thing, right? So no surprises here that he's trying to potentially worm his way out of the deal. That would be very bad for Twitter. I think at this point, everybody is expecting it and it is priced in. Basically all I got for you guys today. So today I'm going to be on Varney and Company uh, around 1130. That is on Fox Business Channel. I think it's actually the highest rated business and markets show on mainstream television. I never know exactly what they're going to ask, but uh, it seems that I get called onto TV a lot when things are really bad so that I can answer for the entire crypto industry as to why I think that we uh, still deserve to exist. So perhaps that is what I have to look forward to. I have a feeling we'll be talking quite a bit about regulation, what's possibly coming about Luna, about the uh, you know existential risks of investors being in crypto. And I'm just going to go tell them to buy Bitcoin, man. Go tell them to buy Bitcoin. Go tell them to buy Bitcoin. Guys, please check out Vald. One day I'm going to get the thing going in the right direction. 
Uh, where's the link to watch you guys ask? It's actually on the, it's like on a television. I'm sure there will be a link. I'm sure that they stream it online somewhere, but it's Fox Business Network. Barney and Co. He's on from nine to 12. Uh, so yeah. And uh, we're going to, as you said, we're going to show them, show them what, show them what we're working with. You're surprised. I was on CBS last week. I've been on Making Money with Charles Payne on Fox Business quite a few times. I've been on these networks uh, quite a lot. And like I said, they only call when shit is bad. <laughs> like I, don't, I don't get the Bitcoin chopping sideways and boring calls. I get the everything's on fire and answer for your community. Yeah. Um, do you advocate 100% vault and trust the platform? Listen, I trust them absolutely. I have a lot of my own money on there, but, but this is crypto. This is crypto. I do not know the inner workings to a degree. So I keep my coins spread out over a number of these platforms. I've talked about that quite a bit. I would never put all of my money on any platform in crypto or advocate for that. You need to do your own research. Yeah. I might actually throw on uh, some nicer clothes this time on CBS. I threw on a t-shirt because YOLO, man. But yeah. Um, statistically, how often does your four-hour bullish divergence work? Uh, that's hard. That's a, a very difficult question to answer. I would say that you generally statistically get a major bounce. You could say, how often is it the bottom? I have no idea. How often is it a bottom? Probably at least over 70% of the time. But to be quite frank, there's nobody doing that uh, math and those statistics. Yeah. Yeah. What is this television you talk about? Nobody knows about those anymore. Right. Yeah. I need a tuxedo t-shirt. That'll be good. Right. Anyways, guys, I really do need to go and get ready for that because we're doing a test in a couple minutes. Dre SPF even put on a suit when he went to Congress though. Right. So it does happen. It does happen. Um, yeah, guys, that is all that I have for you today. I hope that you have a wonderful time. And at the bottom is in, that would be awesome. Peace, guys.